So we'll start with exam two review, um, going through the logistics and what it covers. So exam two will cover the skeletal system, joints, muscles, and the nervous system. Same thing, we'll start with lecture. So the lecture exam is exactly um, similar to the first lecture exam where there are 50 questions. The first 40 that you see will be multiple choice. And the last 10 that you see will be fill in the blank. Some people like to do the do it in order. <clears throat> excuse me. Some people like to do it in order from one to fifty. Some people like to do the fill in the blank first and then move back. Whichever you use, try to keep it in kind of a, a sequential order and then not move around too much. Um, one, because if you've seen a question, I can't let you. If something, if technical things happen, there's no way I can let you um, take the exam if you've already seen every single question. So just kind of take one at a time and um, start either from the top, number one to number 50, or do number 50, 40 to number 50, then go back from number one to number 40. Okay, questions on that? I do divide the questions evenly because a lot of students are like, oh, is she gonna emphasize on this or that? No, it's divided very evenly. So amongst these four chapters, um, actually, there's so skeletal is one chapter, joints is one, muscles is two, nervous is technically two and a half. So I divide my questions up um, based on that. Okay. And let's see, for both lecture and lab exam, make sure you have respondents locked down. So it's actually exactly the same thing that you did before. Respondents locked down plus the webcam. Make sure you have a thorough environmental scan. And that's for you and not for me, okay? Um, if you can't do a thorough environmental scan because your camera is kind of stuck in one place, then have a mirror in the background. So it just you know shows that it removes any doubt in case respondents like flags you, okay? If you have any questions about that, just let me know, okay? And then for lab, it is 30 questions. They are all fill in the blanks of typing, identification. And they're similar to the last lab exam that you took, and they're similar to the quizzes that you took. Okay, so spelling counts. Okay, any questions about the logistics of it? So essentially you have all Sunday and until Monday, 11 p.m. to, to take it. Any questions on it, on the logistics or any, anything before we go right into it? Okay, let's go right into it then. So for the skeletal system, you wanna make sure that you know the types of bones. So what's a short bone, what's a flat bone, what's an irregular bone, what's a long bone. Now, even though you have to know all four of these types of bones, we do focus a lot on the long bone. And you'll find that here and here, the microscopic and um, macroscopic anatomy of the long bone, okay? But a test question could be, <clears throat> uh, what's an example of an irregular bone? What would you say? The sternum? The sternum is actually a flat bone. Vertebrae. The vertebrae, exactly. Vertebrae would be an example of an irregular bone. Very good. All right. Um, it, a test question might be just to ask you the definition. What does it mean to be um, a flat bone or what does it mean to be a long bone? So for example, um, a test question might be, you have a bone that where it's width, height, is equal to each other. What would you say? A short bone. Yeah, exactly. Okay. All right. Then you have you should know the functions of bones. 
um, which include movement. And it's just not movement by itself, but it's in association with muscles. Stabilization, it creates the framework for everything to hang on. So for example, um, your skeletal system that forms your skull, your rib cage, and your, the bones of your, your hand and your, your arm and your leg. So they, 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 they create a, a framework so your skin can hang on, your organs can nicely be um, compartmentized. Another function then is function, I'm sorry, is protection, okay? So the skeletal system allows for protection in a few ways. So one of those ways are through the cages. What do I mean by cages? You would probably mean like maybe the rib cage um, protects the internal organs. Perfect, exactly, okay. It can also protect through red blood cell production, but red blood cell production is its own function, okay. So allows for red blood cell production as well as mineral storage. What do we mean by mineral storage? How does the skeletal system, how do bones allow for mineral storage? Like the bone marrow? Okay, expand on that. So what, do you, what would you find in bone marrow? Um, well, there's two different types of bone marrow, the yellow and the red. Mm -hmm. So for example, what would you find in the red bone marrow? Red blood cells. Right, yep. So is there somewhere else besides the, the medullary cavity of a long bone that allows for, of any bone actually, that allows for mineral storage? In the bone tissue? That's right. What part of the bone tissue? Um, in the, it's like the inorganic, um, what is it, hydroxypiotate? <laughs> Perfect. Hydroxyapatite. Yep. Okay. So what's hydroxyapatite? <laughs> um, it is crystallized salt of um, calcium and phosphate. Exactly. And those are also minerals. Okay. So calcium phosphate is stored in bone matrix. Okay. So your bone, what makes the bone is the calcium, right? That's the calcium phosphate is crystallized and forms the actual bone, but it's also a way to store it because a lot of us don't realize that bone is actually a very dynamic organ, okay? So what happens is that it's not always solid, right? Because what's going to happen is your body will, will break down the bone tissue, thus release the calcium phosphate, and it will build it up and thus take calcium phosphate from the body, from the blood to build it up, okay? So it's, it's in kind of constant transition. Okay, because we think, oh, when we see a bone, okay, it's always like that in the body. It's not. It kind of it helps to um, create equilibrium of calcium by breaking down breaking down the bone tissue to release the calcium, building it up to store the calcium. Okay, questions about that? Okay. All right, so then the next thing that you should know is the anatomy of the long bone. Make sure you know the structure and the function. So we're gonna just draw it really quick. Here's the structure that one of you had talked about. Okay, so 
the ends of a long bone, we'll just call that number one. What would you call the ends of a long bone? I'm gonna mispronounce this, I'm sure, but ep epiphysis? You did not mispronounce it, epiphysis. Okay, so the ends of a long bone are, are called the epiphysis. And how about the shaft of a long, oh, oops. <laughs> how about the shaft of a long bone? The diaphysis. Perfect. And here's the funny thing. There is no one pronunciation because I'm taking um, anatomy physiology in the northern countries, in the southern countries, and they pronounce it differently. For example, respiratory is one way of saying it. Respiratory is another way of saying it. So really there's, there, I mean, there's like a, a way, a few ways to say it, but you know, it's about whether you can spell it and identify it. That's what's important to me, okay? So you've got the diaphysis, which is the shaft of the long bone, okay? Now, along the epiphysis, you have this structure. Start thinking about what it is and what it's made up of and what's its function. Okay. All right, so now I'd like you to contribute. So what, what would number three be? Is that articular cartilage? Perfect. What is it made up of? Hyaline cartilage? Perfect, hyaline cartilage, yep. And what is its function? It reduces friction and allows for smooth movement. Yeah, because when you move, you're the ends of a long bone rub against each other. Okay, so you want some, some protection between that rubbing, between that articulation. And that's why it's called articular cartilage. It's the cartilage that helps when your bone articulates and move against each other and prevents them from rubbing, rubbing it's rubbing away. Okay. Unfortunately, part of an aging process, what happens when you get older? Your bones become brittle. Yes, your bone does become brittle, but also that articular cartilage starts to thin out or wear away in certain people and causes arthritis. Okay, is when two bones rub against each other and you, it does it anytime you move, when they articulate against each other. And if, there's, if the cartilage isn't there, it's very painful because bone actually has a lot of nerve, a lot of nerves that go through it and a lot of blood supply. Okay, so the articular cartilage is there to prevent that bone from bone rubbing against each other, that friction, okay? Um, and that's what it is, okay? Then you have this structure. If ever a time I forget to pause and ask if there's any questions and you do have questions, just go ahead and just say, I have a question. I do not mind being interrupted at all. Surrounding the epiphysis, I'm sorry, surrounding the diaphysis, the shaft, you have this. Now this is just a cross section, so you're just seeing the layers, but it actually wraps around the whole um, diaphysis. What is this? Would it be the periosteum? Very good, and you are absolutely right. It's the periosteum. Okay. So you have the periosteum on the outside and you have what on the inside then? The endosteum. Endosteum, very good, okay. So the periosteum, what is it and what does it do? Don't be shy, just answer. It doesn't have to be correct. This is where, this is the best time to be incorrect because then you can, we can all help each other fix it and then you'll have the right answer. So just it is reticular connective tissue. 
it is connective tissue. Um, there may be a little bit, but it's mostly um, fibrous connective tissue, okay, that you find around the, the, that makes up the periosteum, okay. Then how about the endosteum? So we'll kind of do a, a 4A and a 4B. What's significant about the endosteum? It does have connective tissue as well. Both of them have connective tissue. But what's specialized about the endosteum? There's one thing you had to know about it. What does it contain? What kind of cell would you find in the endosteum? Is it like the bone marrow? No, not the bone marrow. Good guess, though. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we haven't talked about it yet, but we will in the next set of slides. But it's significant in that it contains osteogenic cells. Okay, osteogenic cells. What's, what's significant about the osteogenic cells? Are they the ones that reproduce? Exactly. Okay, so it has the ability to reproduce and make bone cells, right? So if I asked you a question, so initially during fetal development, we actually build bone inward, outward. That's the endo endoosteum um, ossification, okay? So endochondrial ossification, because it happens on the inside and then builds outward. That's during fetal development. But as an adult, if you were to break your bone, <clears throat> if you were to break it, if you had a fracture and break it, right? How would it actually repair itself? Would it repair itself from the inside out or from the outside in? From the inside out? It's actually reversed because the endosteum is kind of towards the outside. Do you see that? It's the inner layer. So on the outside, you have the periosteum. On the inside, you have the endosteum. Do you see where I, I have that 4B arrow? So when you fracture a bone, your bone's actually going to heal from the outside inward. Why? Because the endosteum contains osteogenic cells that allow you to reproduce new bone cells and thus create new bone matrix as it's forming. Okay. Does that make sense? So if you were to fracture a bone, you, your bone would actually heal from the outside inwards. Why? Because of the osteogenic cells that you'd find in the endosteum. Okay, questions? Okay, then we have this structure right here. Let's use a different color, let's use red. No, I want to use blue. Did not change. What's number five then? And here's number five as well. What's number five? The, the growth plate. Yeah. And it actually has three names and you are responsible for knowing both all, all of the, the three parts. So what, what does it go by? So the growth plate is also known as the? Epiphyseal plate? Yes. And one more name. 
metaphysics. Perfect. And it's kind of cool because meta meaning changing, right? So the growth plate is also known as the metaphysis or the epiphyseal plate because it changes, okay? And it allows for what? Growth. Exactly. Okay. I don't have much of an epiphyseal plate if you ever get to meet me because I'm super short. I'm 4'10", sadly. <sighs> okay. But anyways, most people have a good chunk of epiphyseal plate that during puberty, the growth hormone targets and allows it to transition. Originally, the epiphyseal plate before puberty is made up of what substance? It's kind of like a, 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 a space saver. Hyaline cartilage. Very good. It's made of hyaline cartilage. When puberty hits and that growth hormone starts to be released, it's going to target the epiphyseal plate or the metaphysis, and it's going to cause that hyaline cartilage to break down and what fills it out and allows the bone to elongate, has, hence, you know, get taller. Um, it becomes bone tissue, osteocytes. Okay, so the hyaline car cartilage is replaced by, by bone tissue. Okay, does that make sense? Any questions it's about the metaphysis? So if any of you are into forensic science and if you find a skeleton, what they can do is they can do measurements of the bone, but they can also look for the the metaphysis to see what's in them, okay? So they can tell, well, maybe this is just a short older, I'm so sorry, my cats are going crazy. Um, so they can determine whether a person is an adult, but just a short adult by looking at the epiphyseal plate. Is it still highly in cartilage or has it converted to bone tissue, okay? So you can use the epiphyseal plate, that area, to determine whether you're looking at an adult or at a child. A child will have highly in cartilage or it'd be hollow, and with an adult, it would that space is gone. It'd be completely merged into the, the bone tissue. Okay. All right. So last spot. What's this one? The medullary cavity. Perfect. So the medullary cavity is a space. And what's in that space? You already know this. One of your classmates already told us. Bone marrow. Exactly. Now, it's really interesting because bone marrow starts off as red bone marrow. Okay, so that's where you're producing red blood cells abundantly. And unfortunately, as you age, part of the aging process, like when you are around your 40s to 50s, it starts to transition from red bone marrow to yellow bone marrow. Okay, so essentially that space transitions from red bone marrow where it's making red blood cells to yellow bone marrow where it's being it's storing fat okay and that's why a natural process of aging is getting a little bit of weight yep and you can just blame it on this and then it transitions from red to yellow and eventually it's actually going to become gelatinous okay so if it transitions from red to yellow does that mean you no longer produce red blood cells when you get old So I'll repeat the question. So does that mean that when you get old, you no longer produce red blood cells? No. no. <laughs> of course not, right? You have to make red blood cells. You don't just like, okay, I'm 50, 60, uh, line two, my, you know, <laughs> pass away. No, you still make red, you still make red bone marrow. What area consistently makes red bone marrow? It makes red blood cells.
Make a guess. Completely fine to be wrong. I encourage you to be wrong. <laughs> I'll give you clues, one through six. Clue is not six because we, we have now age and it has now become yellow bone marrow. The endosperm, endosperm. Close guess. So the <laughs> endosperm is already has the osteogenic cells. So it's okay. it's already busy producing bone tissue. Mm. Thank you, though. So thank you. You've eliminate one for us. So now you have one, two, three. 4A or 5. Keep going. The periosteum? Good guess. The periosteum is already filled with the connective tissue. Thank you for eliminating one more for us. Diaphysis. The diaphysis contains the medullary cavity. So that kind of takes care of it and the, the bone tissue that then fills that space. So that's not it either. We're down to a little bit more. So keep going. So it's either one, three, or five. I believe that's what you have left as an option. I like hearing that. You're checking your notes. Is it in my notes? It's the epiphysis. So in the epiphysis, you'll find trabecula. And the spaces in the trabecula houses um, red bone marrow. And that's where you'll consistently produce red blood cells. It's in the epiphysis. So you've got the medullary cavity in the diaphysis that starts out producing some red blood cells. And then as you age, it transitions to yellow bone marrow, so no longer does it. But in the epiphysis, the space that's occupied between the trabecula, the bone shards, that's where you'll find um, more red bone marrow. Okay, great. All right. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a, a saw and go. Okay. I'm going to saw the bone in half. Okay. So what you're looking at now is the cut of a long bone. Okay, so this, what am I drawing in green again? Remind me. The periosteum. Very good. On the outside is the periosteum, on the inside it's the? Periosteum. Very good. Endosteum. Perfect. Okay. Then what is this representing right here? Medullary cavity. Perfect, thank you. Oh. Ah. Six. That's the medullary cavity because I just took a cut of it, right? Now, along the diaphysis, okay, in between the periosteum, endosteum, and the medullary cavity, you will actually find these things. If you can guess what I'm about to draw, go ahead and say it out loud. What 
What am I drawing here? Osteons? So yes, exactly. So along the diaphysis, so just the diaphysis, along the diaphysis, it is filled with compact bone tissue. Compact bone tissue. Not spongy bone tissue, compact bone tissue. The building blocks of compact bone tissue are what? You said it, just say it again. Osteons. Perfect. Now I'm drawing it as a circle because you're seeing a cross section of it, but osteon is a stick. It looks like a stick, okay? Like a tube. So I'm gonna pull one out. I'm gonna pull an osteon out. And now this circle right here represents one of those circles. So it's an osteon and it's actually a tube. So it kind of goes longer, okay? So what I am drawing here is I'm gonna label it letter A. So this is letter A, and A is an osteon, okay? So osteons are functional units of what again? Osteons are functional unit of what? Compact bone. Perfect, and that is a test question in the past, okay? So I'm gonna zoom in and look at the microscopic anatomy of a long bone. So you can't see this with your eyes really, okay? You can see osteons, but you can't, well, depending on how, how, how high your, um, the cut is or how big the cut is. But so when you get to the osteon and, and inward, you have to use a microscope to see this, okay? So an osteon actually looks very similar to the cut of the diaphysis. As you can see, it looks pretty similar, right? Right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. So it also has a hollow inside, a, a hollow center. But the hollow center is what? The central canal? Yeah, exactly. And what would you find in the central canal? Two things. Uh, blood vessels. Yes, ma'am. One more. And nerves. Perfect. You got it. Okay. So I add a few more things in here. So in an osteon, you're going to see something like this. Okay, and it, it has kind of like a, it looks like this. Imagine these packets all over, right? I'm just too lazy and want to save your time and not have them dry. So this section right here is going to be all over, okay? So in an ASEAN, you have these packets right here. I'm going to shade one in for you. So these packets right here. This space is called what? What is this pocket called? Now, what are these pockets called? I'm shading them in right now. What are these pockets called? Is it the lamb malay or? No, not lamella. No, no. 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 okay. But good guess. That's a good guess. The lacunae? Yes. Yep. The lacunae or lacunae. Either way, one's plural, one's one single. So either way, it's accepted. But how I remember is it's a little lake, like the, the lac, lacuna, lac, lake. Okay. So that's how I remember. It's like a little pond looking structure. Okay. So the areas that I shade in is called the lacunas because it contains what? It's, it's a pocket space that contains what? The osteocytes. Yes, exactly. 
that is a test question in the past. So you just got it. One, one question bonus. Okay. So it, it contains osteocytes. Exactly. Now, you know what osteocytes look like, right? Osteocytes look like this. Okay. Or we can go forward a little bit. So osteocytes look like this right here. Okay, so it fits in that lacuna perfectly. But you notice that it has these dendrites, right? The osteocytes has these dendrites. So it needs a space to contain those dendrites. What is that space called that contains the dendrites or the processes of the osteocytes? What are those channels called? The channels that contain the dendrites and allows for things to move back and forth and in between. The canaliculi. Yes, perfect. Great job. The canaliculi. It sounds like, like a Italian dessert. You know, like the canaliculi, you know, like the, the, the tube, the, the Italian dessert that's like a, a breaded tube and then they fill ricotta cheese inside. That's a, what's that called? A cannoli? Yeah, a cannoli. Yeah, that's how I remember <laughs> it. You'll notice that I reference a lot to food because <laughs> I'm such a foodie. Okay. So, yeah, the cannolis, that's a good way to remember it. So the canaliculites are like the cannolis. They're like tubes. Instead of containing the delicious ricotta cheese, it contains the dendrite processes of the osteocyte. Okay? All right. Then between the lacuna and the canaliculi, it creates like this, um, this layering to occur. Okay? So these layers that occur is because it's building around the canaliculi and the lacuna, and it's filling it with bone matrix. So what are these layers called? Not the, not the, the tubes that connect the lacunas, but the actual layering. The lamellae? Yes. So these are called concentric rings of lamella. And again, you can pronounce it any way you want, okay? As long as you know what it is. So they're concentric rings of lamella. Uh, so I'm gonna span, expand on E a little bit. Concentric rings. And these concentric rings contain what? So what do you find in bone besides the osteocytes, the cells? What else is bone made up of? Give you a clue, it starts with an M. Nerves? Not nerves. Marrow? Not marrow. But you're getting closer, you're getting to the M. So if you look at bone tissue, you always find three things. You find the cells and what other two things do you find? And those two things together is called something. The matrix. Yeah, that's it. That's the word I'm looking for, okay? So the concentric rings are made up of matrix. And you know that matrix is made up of two things. One, it's got some type of ground substance. And two, it's got some type of fiber. Okay, what ground substance would you find in the matrix of a bone, bone tissue? Someone actually talked about it at the very beginning when we talked about mineral storage. The hydroxy appetite. Perfect. Okay, calcium phosphate. What fiber would you find in bone? Think about it. Is bone really strong? Is bone flexible? 
It's a collagen. Yes, because collagen allows for strength and durability. Okay. So that's what makes up the, the lamella, concentric rings of mela, mela, lamella, which is matrix. And matrix consists of calcium phosphate and collagen. Questions? Okay, does this help visualize things at all? It does. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yep. Boy. All right, one more and then we'll be done. So B is the central canal. Now the central canal just kind of runs, oh, I need to do A. Runs all the way down because remember it's a tube, right? But there's also tubes that go outwards, sideways to make sure that all the cells on the outer rim of that of that circle gets blood supply as well. So what do we call that? The perforating canals? Yep, that's all they are. Okay, so there you go. You've got the structure and the function of the macroscopic and microscopic anatomy of a long pole. Okay, questions? All right. So now we go to a little bit more detail. So, so you know what the structure looks like. Now we're gonna talk about cells, bone tissue, and bone formation. In terms of cells, you need to know that there are four types of cells. It starts off as osteogenic cells. And the osteogenic cells develop into osteoblasts. And the osteoblast develops into osteocytes. Okay, and that's why osteogenic cells are the stem cells that divide. When they divide, they become osteoblast. Osteoblast, I just remember this B in osteoblast means it's building. It's the bone building cell. So, so do you remember how I drew the, the lacuna? Here. Okay. So what you'll find is the osteoblast is there. And what it's going to do is that it's going to pull the calcium phosphate towards itself. The matrix is going to form the matrix around itself. And then it becomes trapped in what now becomes the lacuna. When it becomes trapped and it's no longer building bone tissue around it, it's now referred to as what? And osteocyte. Perfect. That's the difference. So it starts off as an osteogenic cell, becomes an osteoblast, builds the bone matrix around itself, and forms that cavity that we then call a lacuna. But once it's trapped inside, it no longer builds bone. So then it's then called an osteocyte. Make sense? Okay. Then not a part of this this transitioning of cells. By itself, you have the osteoclast. So osteoclast is kind of a cell by itself. It does not come from the osteogenic, osteoblast, or osteocyte. It's just a cell by itself. And what's important about this is the bone reabsorbing cell. So it breaks bone tissue down, okay? How it does that is if you look at the ruffled borders right here, It's going to contain enzymes like lysozymes. And you know what lysozymes do, right? You learned that in chapter and in the cell chapter. What do lysozymes do? Break down or sanitize. Yeah. Digest, right? It breaks Digest. things down. Yeah. Mm hmm Yeah. So if you drink a whole bucket of a gallon of milk. And now you have tons of calcium in your body and you want, you need to maintain homeostasis. So your bloodstream is high in calcium because of the drinking of that milk. You need to store that calcium into bone. So what cell would you stimulate? Would you stimulate the osteoblast or would you stimulate the osteoclast?
So one more time, lots of milk, blood high in calcium. You need to store that calcium into bone. So what cell would you stimulate? The osteoblast or the osteoclast? The osteoblast. Perfect. Because it's going to take that calcium from blood. It's going to wrap it, you know, build matrix around itself into the bone. And that's how mineral storage occurs in bone. Let's say you got lost in, you went hiking and you got lost. No calcium around. It's been weeks. Your body needs calcium. And you'll, you've, you've learned that, right? You need calcium in muscle contraction and nerve impulse conduction and such. So you need a certain level of calcium in blood, but you have no source of calcium in your dietary. So your bloodstream is really low in calcium. What cell would your body stimulate so that you can increase calcium levels in blood? The osteoclast. Perfect. Now, do you see, do you understand why I say that bone tissue is consistently transitioning? It's changing. It's building, breaking, building, breaking. It's not like a, a set thing where once you build bone, that's it. Does that make sense? It's kind of cool, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's cool, right? <laughs> yes, it is. I had no idea how any of this happened before this. <laughs> Yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah. Now, we also learn, just to kind of connect it to real life, we also learn that um, you need vitamin D. Okay? So you need vitamin D to help move the calcium back and forth, okay? Particularly into bone. So there was a case in Minnesota like 10 years ago where these adopt adopted um, foster parents they, they adopted tons of kids and they left them in the basement. And these kids ended up with a condition called rickets because they weren't, they weren't exposed to the sun, no vitamin D. So their bones became what? Thick or thin? Thin. Yeah, it became really brittle. Okay, so rickets is a condition where your bone becomes really brittle because you're not depositing calcium into it. It became really porous, very similar to osteoporosis almost, okay? But in young children, because they didn't have enough exposure to the sun, thus vitamin D was absent, couldn't shuttle the calcium into bone, okay? So just disease-wise, okay. All right, so that is osteogenic, osteo, now everyone's gonna be all sad. <laughs> osteogenic, osteoblast, osteocyte, and osteoclast, okay? Then we talked a little bit about bone tissue earlier. You have two main types. You have compact bone and spongy bone, okay? Compact bone is heavy, made up of osteons. Where would you find compact bone? In a long bone, where would you find compact bone tissue? You know this. In the, in the diaphysis. Yes, exactly. Okay. If your every single bone was all compact bone, you wouldn't be able to move. <clears throat> the bone would be so heavy, it would drag you down. And we need to be able to move, right? And that's a survival thing. You can't run away from prey. They will eat you. There would be no humanity, right? So you have to have a good balance between compact bone for strength, but you also need spongy bone for it to be lighter. So in spongy bone, it's still strong. Don't get me wrong, it's still strong because the shards of bone tissue called trabecula are formed along the stress line, okay? But it's not as dense. It's not as heavy as compact bone, okay? So where compact bone is made of osteons, spongy bone is made of trabecula. Where would you find spongy bone in a long bone? The epiphysis. Perfect. You got it. Also potential test questions. Okay. All right. Bone formation. So with bone formation, you have two main types. You have endochondrial ossification and intramembranous ossification. Both of these occur during fetal development. Oops, 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 oops. There we go. Okay. So endochondrial ossification 
It's responsible for building what type of bone mainly? Make a guess, an educated guess, because all of you have studied already. Long bones? Yeah, exactly. So mainly long bones, where intramembranous ossification focuses mainly on what? Flat bones. Exactly. See, you knew this. Okay. So endochondrial ossification, just like its name, it uses what material to kind of build or, or lay the template to build bone? Chondro. Anytime you hear the term chondro, you think what? Cartilage. Yes, exactly. So it uses a hyaline cartilage model to kind of lay down what the long bone should look like. So that's the first step. Then it breaks it down and then it converts the, the hyaline cartilage into actual bone tissue. Okay, and in this case, it would be the compact bone tissue along the diaphysis and the um, spongy bone tissue or trabecula along the epiphysis. Okay, so endo meaning it starts where first? Inside out, outside in. Inside out. Yes. That's right. Intramembranous. Membranous refers to the fact that it uses a substance called mesenchyme. Mesenchyme. That's a starting material. Okay. And intramembranous tells you it's like a it's like a sandwich, right? So it it's like a sandwich with like this. So it builds the, the layer three layers of a sandwich, okay? And it uses what substance? What substance is used to make intermembranous ossification? I just wanna hear you say it, because if you say it, you're more likely to remember it. The mesenchyme? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> All right. So this is kind of to review everything. Okay, I did this in my in-person class. I draw on the board and I kind of label. So use this, it, it's a cleaner picture than the one that I drew um, because I, I'm not very good with drawing on, on, the, on, on my um, laptop, okay? So you can see that you start off with what a bone looks like. Then I break the bone and, and you get the osteons. And then we look, took a closer look at the osteons. These are what it's called, okay? So that's just a nice review of everything. Any questions before I move on to joints? No. Okay. So joints is pretty memorization, okay? So when you're doing memorization, if, you just, if you're just reading it as a paragraph, it's really hard to remember and recall and even more difficult to recall, okay? So that's why it's really important to make these cognitive maps because then you can visualize these maps, okay? You're like, oh, okay, I had the types, I had the structure, I had the movement and the examples. So the term synarthrosis isn't a type of joint, it's a movement, okay? Because a lot of terms in joints sound the same, synarthrosis, syndesmosis, synchondrosis, okay? Lots of sins, okay? <laughs> So it's nice to have this chart so that you can see the words and what it belongs to. Because sometimes I'll ask for examples. Let's say I'll, I'll ask for what type of um, joint would be found between two long bones. And students will write synarthrosis. I'm like, no, that's a movement. That's not a type. Okay. So making a cognitive map is a really good way to say in any class, when you have lots of information that are similar, it helps you divide it up. So I did one for you already. So in terms of main types, there's fibrous. And what's made, what makes up the fibrous joints? It's fibers. Fibrous joints allow for what kind of range of movement? It's synarthrosis, so no movement. And examples that you're required to know include sutures, gomphosis, and syndesmosis. So then you would do this for the rest. Okay, so you have fibrous joints, you have cartilaginous joints, you have synovial joints, okay? So make sure you fill out this, this map. Questions on this before I move on? I'm 
sure I read all your chats. Okay. All right. No questions? I'm sure you have questions, but it takes time for me to process information as well. So I'll, I'll have questions like an hour after the meeting's over. <laughs> and if that's the case, you, you send me an email, okay? All right. So including the memorization for joints, you'll also want to know about the synovial um, joint, uh, joint itself, the, the following terms. You'll want to know what a meniscus is versus what's a bursa, what's a synovial capsule, what's a synovial cavity versus what's an articular cartilage. So having pictures always helps me kind of distinguish what is what. So I provided that for you there. Do you have any questions about any of these be um, before we move on? Because I want to make sure we have a chance to look at the questions, the sample questions. Okay. All right. So I had a request for skeletal. I spent the majority of the time on skeletal, and the rest will just kind of provide you a brief overview. Okay. So muscles, um, function, structure, make sure you know the neuromuscular junction, that's NMJ, the sliding filament theory, and metabolism. A lot of you did really good job on your videos in terms of going through these things. So watch each other's videos because it's always good to hear it from someone else because sometimes that clicks more than hearing it from, from me, okay? So um, let's just provide a brief overview. So you've got the bone, the, the long bone, which we talked about already. So now we know that bone allow for movement through associating with, association with muscles. And here's the association right here. So bone is connected to muscle through what substance? Let's see if I can make this bigger. So what's the attachment? What attaches muscle to bone? Tendons. Yes, very good. What attaches bone to bone? Ligaments. Yes, very good. Okay. So tendons attach bone to muscle. So if I took one muscle, like if you like, you know, the muscle you see on your body, just like look at your arm right now. That you know, the biceps brachii muscle, for example. Okay. So you have that muscle, but that muscle in general is called the muscle group. And that muscle group is going to be surrounded by connective tissue called So what's this green structure that's surrounding that muscle group in overall? Epimysium? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Now, if I peel the muscle, the muscle group apart, I would have bundles of these thinner tubes called fascicles. So fascicles make up muscles or muscle groups. Fascicles also have connective tissue that surrounds it. What's the connective tissue that surrounds the fascicles? Paramysium, paramysium. Yep. Exactly. Peri meaning around, mycium means muscle. So around the fascicle, I would find the paramycium. Around the muscle itself, I will find the epimycium. Now, the fascicles, if I peel that apart, it would break down to sm even smaller tubes. And those smaller tubes are called what we actually call a muscle cell. Okay, so that is a muscle cell. So muscle cells make up the fascicles. Now, when I say cell, you tell me shape, okay? What shape do you think about when you think of a cell? A circle or a star. Exactly, right? So when someone thinks of a cell, you automatically think of a circle cell. That's what we learned about in, in the third chapter on cells, right? Here, a muscle cell does not is not a circle. The muscle cell is long, and because of that, it looks like a fiber, even though it's a cell. Okay, let that sink in. It looks like a fiber, but it's actually a cell. 
The significance of that is because when we learn fibers, fibers are protein, right? And protein is a molecule or macromolecule where a cell is a higher level of organization than that. Remember we had atoms to molecules, to organelles, to organs, okay? Or it's actually to organelles, to cell, and then to, or to tissue, to organs, and so on, organ systems and so on, okay? So to say, so when we say a muscle fiber, it can't be, it's, an, it's, an, a, it's a cell. It's not at the molecule level, but we call it a muscle fiber because it looks long like a fiber, but it is a cell. Okay, that's one of the things that, that tricks students up a lot. They're like, what? But you just said it's a muscle fiber. Yes. I said it's a muscle fiber because that's what we call it because it, it's not like the round cell. It's, it looks like a fiber, but it's not an actual fiber. And that's why when we, when we identify fibers in a muscle cell, we call them myofibrils instead of calling them just fibers. It's really confusing. Okay. So whenever anyone says a muscle fiber, they mean it's the cell. Okay. And when they're referring to fibers inside of a cell, they'll use the term myofibrils or myofilaments. Did you notice that as you're studying, like the actin and the, and the myosin, they're not called fibers, even though they are fibers. They're called what? What are they called? called myofibers, right? Or myofilaments, okay? All right, so a muscle cell can be called interchangeably with a muscle fiber, okay? So that muscle fiber is surrounded, it's also surrounded by connective tissue. What do we call that connective tissue that surrounds the muscle fiber? Endomesium. Yes, thank you. Because at this point, it's on the inside. Okay. All right. So if I took that muscle fiber and I zoomed in, this is what the cell would look like on the, the right-hand side. Okay. So the muscle fiber or the muscle cell has the plasma membrane. And here's what, here's what, you know, makes the muscle tissue, muscle chapter so difficult is because it's the same structure that you would find in, in a cell that you learned earlier, but it goes by a different name. So again, an another thing I would recommend you doing for this is making that table. The plasma membrane of a muscle cell is called, you fill in the blank. The sarcolemma. Perfect. The smooth ER of a muscle cell is called Sarcoplasmic reticulum. Very good. The cytoplasm of a muscle is called? Sarcoplasm. Very good. Okay. It's the same thing. It just has a different name to it. Usually there's sarca or myo that replaces it. Because sarca means flesh. Myo means muscle. Okay. So they use the term either sarco or myo. All right, so you've got the sarcolemma, which is the plasma membrane of a muscle cell. Now, the sarcolemma is unique in two ways. Look at, your, look at the picture I provided you. How is the plasma membrane of a muscle cell different? Or what does, what does it have that you, that you didn't study in the plasma membrane of a regular cell? The transverse tubules? Absolutely. That's one. One more. A 
I'm stuck. You have classmates. <laughs> Talk amongst yourself. That's some quiet talking amongst yourself. <laughs> How about what is this structure? Does anyone know what this is called? I the can't receptors? Oh, she. They contain the receptors, absolutely. But what is that structure called? Is it the cisterna, the terminal cisterna? No, the, the terminal cisterna is good to know, but that's not it. But you should definitely know that term as well. It can be called one of two things. One, the junctional folds. Two, the motor end plate. Okay, so it's either, when I went to school, it was called the motor end plate but your textbook calls it the junctional folds. And that, that's specific because that's where you find the receptors there for acetylcholine, okay? So that's two major differences in the plasma membrane or the sarcolemma of a muscle cell that you normally wouldn't find in other cells. So one, the transverse tubules or the T-tubules, and two, the junctional folds or the motor end plate, okay? Great. Then you have um, in, a muscle, in a muscle fiber, you would find lots of these things. What are these things? I'm not sure what you're pointing to. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me underline another one. Is that Is mitochondria? mitochondria? <laughs> Absolutely. It's mitochondria. Okay. How about this one? That's the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Very good. What do you find inside it? The terminal cisternae. Cis yep. And what else do you find in there? Calcium? Yes. So here you're seeing another role that where calcium is important. Okay. And these things right here, I'm not going to ask you what they are because you wouldn't know unless I tell you. So that's my my funky drawing of um, glycogen. What's glycogen? It is a polysaccharide made of glucose. Yes, they're chains of glucose, exactly. And then these things right here are unique to muscles as well. It's a protein that contains oxygen. What is it? Myoglobin. Yes. And that's the basics of what you need to know of the structure of a muscle fiber. You need to know it has a sarcolemma that has two unique features, the transverse tubules and the, fun the junctional folds. You need to know that on the inside, it's got the sarcoplasmic reticulum that contains calcium. You need to know it has abundant mitochondria, abundant glycogen and myoglobin. And eventually we're gonna put it together, okay? So that's looking at the macroscopic view. Well, you can't really see this with your eye, but you know, it's, it's looking at the, the bigger picture. Then if we zoom in more, okay, in the space where, where I've drawn um, the sarcoplasmic reticulum, the mitochondria, um, the myoglobin, you can overlap it. 
with the bottom picture. Okay, so if you overlap it with the bottom picture, in addition to all those structures, it has these very particular myofibrils. Okay, it's got two main fibers. What are the two main fibers that you find in the muscle fiber? The thin and the thick, what are they? Actin and myosin. Okay, which is the thin? Um, actin is the thin, myosin yep. is thick. Perfect. So I pulled one thin one out on the side right here, and I zoomed in. So that blue line right there is the actin. Now the actin is surrounded by this green and red protein. The green protein is tropomyosin, and the red protein is troponin. Okay? So in addition to the actin, you also have surrounding it the troponin and the tropomyosin. Okay. Now on actin, you it's it's really hard to see. Let me see if I can zoom in a bit. Okay. Can you see that a little bit more zoomed in? Yes. Okay. So on that actin, just look at the blue purplish thing. You notice that they have these holes in there, right? That's clear. Those holes are where mouse and heads would naturally click onto, bind to, and pull. But currently, what's covering those holes? What's the covering tropomyosin. Those Very good. So what would you say the function of tropomyosin is? To allow the actin to bind mm. to the myosin? What is or it to move so that it can what is it norm what what is it? its natural state is to cover oh, blocking it yeah. that's right so the function of the tropomyosin is to prevent contraction right because if it prevents mm -hmm. myosin heads from grabbing on you can't contract that's good because do you want to normally sit all crunched up and like all contracted all the time no I, I was doing that, but you can't see because I don't have my camera. <laughs> it's lots of effective. But normally you're sitting there cool, relaxing, chilling, right? So your muscles are relaxed. They're not contracting. So that's the default state. The default state is relaxation. So the tropomyosin is doing its job. You don't want to contract unless your brain sends a signal to tell your muscles to contract. So the default is to relax. So if you do want to contract, your brain has to send a signal and eventually that signal has got to tell the tropomyosin to do what? Now you, some of you had already contributed to that. What would tropomyosin need to do in order for you to contract? Move. Yeah. It shifts away. It's not going to do that on its own, which is why in addition to tropomyosin, it always has its partner, which is? Troponin. Yes. And the troponin knows when to move the tropomyosin and when not to, based on whether what is bounded, what, what binds to it. It reacts to what chemical? Calcium. Yes. Okay, so if calcium binds to troponin, troponin is going to pull tropomyosin away. And then myosin heads can grab on and contract. So... Overall, we like to call it the TNT system, tropomyosin, troponin. And overall, they either allow for contraction or they prevent contraction. Okay, make sense? So that's what's on actin. What's on myosin are these little oars. You know, like imagine a boat with the oars that like move, you know? So those oars are called myosin heads. And what's the function of the myosin heads? To move. And okay. how does it move? It's got to do what shortening, first? Shortening or... No. What's it got to do first? Attach. Yes. To what? The actin. Yes. And that process is called cross bridge formation. Okay. The cross bridge formation is when the mouse and heads grab onto the actin. Okay. 
it's got to be energized, right? So once it binds on, it's got to be energized. So what does it need to energize, to become energized? ATP. Yeah. So, so an energized myosin head is going to bind to ATP, and then it's going to consume that energy and pull. Okay. So cross bridge formation first, followed by a power stroke. In order for that power stroke to occur, it must have ATP. It must use consume an ATP. Okay. Questions. So we're starting to slowly piece together muscle contraction. Some additional things you should know is that the actin binds to what? Is attached to what in a muscle fiber? What, what letter does it, what does the shape form? The D line? Or yeah, they, D they're called Z line, Z disc, okay? Mm -hmm. And then the space between two Z lines is called? Sarcomere. <clears throat> yes, okay. So if I were to ask you, what's the functional unit of a muscle fiber? You would say sarcomere. And the reason for that is because when we say a muscle shortens, it's actually the sarcomere that shortens. So all of those sarcomeres shorten at the same time, and that causes an overall shortening of the, of the muscle fiber. Okay, true or false, actin shortens in muscle contraction. False. False. No, false. Myosin shortens in the muscle contraction. False. That's right. The only thing that shortens is the sarcomere, that space. Okay? Questions? Okay, we got to move on. It's almost... I wanna, um, so I'm going to... I only have a few... Because I want to go through the sample questions. Oh, go ahead. Did they make you part of the supervisor? No. Right. For us teachers, when we sell four items at least, the Lana had to have day on Friday. I'm not sure you have to prove this, you know. Okay. So Do you want me to buy something or what? No, no, no. Ah. The, the reason I'm asking is because we want to take you to lunch that day. Is someone's so, audio on? You're going to be available. Friday? Yeah. I am. No, único es que I have a meeting from 8.30 to 11.30 in La Jolla. So you won't oh, need to fine. wait for me at just, we're gonna be up, Okay, um, so. Our half day is um, 8, 10, 12, 10. Um, oh, okay. So, so I'll let you choose. I sure. only have time to cover one thing. Sí, más, so it should be done by 11.30. So I'll let you choose hour. between um, be contraction or oh, okay. impulse conduction. We can go anywhere since we're going to be I'm Is not going to be You want to type into the chat um, what you prefer? Sure. Thank you. Yes. Right. And I wanted to give you an answer for me because I don't know how your schedule is going to be this way. Yeah, no, we have. Can you type into the chat what you prefer? Or you can unmute yourself and, and tell, let me know. Do you want me to cover muscle contraction or nerve impulse conduction? Nerve impulse conduction, please. Okay. So if you want to do muscle contraction, I, I did it right here for you and I numbered them. So you can follow this right here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move into nervous system then because we only have a limited time left. Um, before I do that, I think there was a question, a, a, um, a request to go through kind of like how to differentiate the, the parts of the nervous system. And this is it right here. So I did this for my in-class and I kind of just organized it for them in this way. So the nervous system is broken down into the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system includes your brain and your spinal cord, where the peripheral nervous system are just all the nerves. And the nerves are classified as either sensory or motor. 
Sensory meaning it's taking information from outside, bringing it into the central nervous system. Motor meaning it's taking it from the central nervous system and bringing it out, okay? So if it's sensory, then that's divided in, into somatic and visceral. Somatic oftentimes is associated with um, more of muscle, where visceral is more associated with internal organs that are more um, involuntary, okay? So motor, same thing, motor is divided into visceral and somatic. And like I said, somatic is often associated with muscles or voluntary responses. And visceral is associated with involuntary or otherwise known as the autonomic nervous system. And then that is broken down into a further subdivision called the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. So it's just a nice chart to kind of show you how things fit into each other and how things are broken down, all right? Then I go through the parts of a neuron, which is the dendrites, the soma, and the axon, and how information only goes in one direction because it's received by the dendrites and it's transmitted by the, the synaptic knob of the axon, okay? I also talk a little bit about the spinal cord and the, um, the brain, okay? But we're gonna, we gotta move forward and talk about nerve impulse conduction, okay? So when we're talking about nerve impulse conduction, there's really four main events. There's resting membrane potential, local membrane potential, threshold potential, and action potential. Okay, so in a resting membrane potential, if we were to look at a neuron, Nothing's happening. There's no signals. Okay, so if no signal, that means that this membrane is at rest. And if it's at rest, we use the term polarized. Okay, and the reason why we use the term polarized is because it is negatively charged. So you're like, why is it negatively charged? That's a great question. Okay. So it's negatively charged because on the inside of the neuron, or what we call the intracellular fluid, okay? So on the inside of that neuron, it's going to have what ion? It's gonna have what ion? Well, if it's negatively charged, you'd think it should have what? A negative ion or an anion or a cation? Would it be anion? That is the educated, that, yeah, absolutely. You think an anion, right? Because it's negatively charged, but it's actually a cation. It's going to contain potassium, and potassium is positively charged. You're like, wait a minute. How is it polarized then? How is it negatively charged? Great question. And that's because in addition to the potassium, it also has, and it's got these proteins that are overall negatively charged, okay? And you know proteins, which one's larger, potassium or protein? Protein. Yes, okay, so the proteins are always in there, they don't move, they're too large, okay? And these proteins are negatively charged. Where you have potassium, which are these small ions that are positively charged that can move in and out, okay? But because of these proteins right here, overall, if I were to read it, it would read negative 70 millivolts, okay? So at resting membrane potential, or when it's called polarized, it is negatively charged. Specifically, it's at negative 70. And yes, you do need to know this number. I normally don't require you to know numbers, but in this instance, you do want to know this number, okay? So polarized meaning it's at negative charge. Specifically, it's at negative 70. There's no signals, nothing's happening. Which means then, if I take this exact same thing, and I put it here. I 
erase a few things. Okay, so now with local potential, it receive a stimulus. Where does it receive a stimulus? At the dendrite, soma, or axon? Where's the only place it can receive a stimulus? The dendrite. <laughs> Perfect. So here's a stimulus. I'm going to do an S with a, a sign through it. Okay. So let's say your brain is wanting to send a signal. It's going to stimulate, it's going to send a chemical to stimulate the dendrites because that's where it, it receives stimulus. Okay. And it's a local membrane potential, which means that local membrane potential only occurs from here to here. This is the local membrane potential area. Just the dendrites and the soma. Okay, it's only impacting those areas. That's what it means to be local. Okay, so that signal is going to be sent. And it's going to go, oh, where's my signal? Here we go. We're going to move along here, move along here, move along here, like so. Okay. Now, the local membrane potential can be weak or it can be strong. So it's graded. Okay. If it's weak, it's going to go back. It's not going to continue. Okay. So that's why characteristics of a local membrane potential is one, it's graded, okay? Two, it can either send or it cannot send, okay? Three, it only occurs along the dendrites and the soma, okay? Now, so what is needed for it to be strong enough to continue onward? Okay, that's a great question. Okay, so first of all, local mem membrane potential is called local because it receives a stimulus at the dendrites and moves along to the soma. Whether it's strong or weak enough, that's what's going to determine whether it becomes, goes from a local membrane potential to an action membrane potential. Okay, so the deciding factor is whether it reaches threshold or not. And the important thing about threshold is that it has to be a 15, it has to be a 15 millivolt difference. Okay, a minimum of a 15 millivolt difference, which means it's got to go from negative 70 millivolts to what at least? Negative 55. Perfect. That's when it reaches threshold potential. So if that stimulus is able to generate at least a 15 millivolt difference, then it's going to reach this. right here, okay? So when it reaches that axon hillock, that's where threshold potential is at, is at the axon hillock. If it's able to meet a minimum of 15 millivolt difference, then it can go on to an action potential. But if not, it's reversible, meaning it can go back. Okay, it will not continue onward. So in a nerve impulse conduction, you receive the stimulus at the dendrite. And the stimulus is going to move along the dendrites to the soma, which we call local membrane potential. Local membrane potential can be of different grade, different strength. It can be reversible, meaning it can, it can go back and not continue onward. Okay. And it is decremental, meaning, you know, as it moves away from that signal, it gets a little bit weaker, okay? Unless it's able to reach threshold potential. 
at threshold potential, that means it had enough strength to cause it to go from negative 70 to negative 55 millivolts at the axon hillock, at which point then that acts on action potential. Question so far. Okay, so what does an action potential look like? It's going to occur along here. Okay. And it's going to look something like this. Here's the signal. It's going to move down, 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 down. It continues onward. Until it reaches the synaptic knob. When it reaches the synaptic knob, that signal is converted into chemicals. Okay. So, my question to you is why is it converting from electrical signal to chemicals? Why is it converting from electrical signals to chemicals? Think about that. What do you think? To get through the synaptic cleft. That's right. So if you have an, a wire, if you don't touch the wire, can you be electrocuted? No. No, you have to be in physical contact. Look at the neuromuscular junction. The neuromuscular junction includes that synaptic cleft, right? So is there a physical contact between the neuron and the muscle cell? No. There isn't. So the electrical impulse can't just go across. And that's why it's got to convert from electrical to chemical in the form of ACH. And then the ACH binds to the receptors at the motor end plate or the junctional folds, and that's when it can go back to being electrical. Does that make sense now? Why it's got, why you have to learn how it goes from electrical to chemical back to electrical? Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. So that's the first layer. Now that we understand the big picture of what happens, we have to go through the individual picture. So how does that happen? How does it go, how does the signal go from the soma to the axon? And then once it gets to the axon, it reaches an action potential. Now, once it reaches the action potential, one, it's no longer graded. It will regenerate its own strength. So it's not, it's not graded at all, okay? It's not decremental. It doesn't lose its strength. And three, it's non-reversible. Once it reaches that axon hillock, it's an all or nothing. It's like when you go up in a roller coaster, as you're going up, you go, you go, oh, no, 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 I need to get off. And they'll let you off. But once you reach that peak, it goes down. There is no getting off. Okay. So once you reach that axon hill, it's called an all or nothing because it's going to go. So the question now is how does it go? Okay. So we know that at the axon hillock right here is that negative 55 millivolts. Okay. So now you have to take into role these pumps right here. They're called pota sodium potassium pumps. Okay. So in an action potential, it involves two steps. Okay. So I'm going to look at this step in particular. I'm going to look at just this one segment right here. Okay. In that one segment, that membrane has to go through two steps. It's got to go through depolarization followed by repolarization. Once that happens, then 
I can shift Maybe not. Oh, okay, it's not letting me shift it. Okay, that's fine. It's going to move from there to this next part. And then from there to this next part until eventually it moves all the way down to the synaptic. Oh, that's too big. It's going to move from segment to segment. So each of these segments has to go through depo, repo, depo, repo until finally. It reaches the synaptic um, bulb. Okay, so what does it mean to undergo depolarization? What does it mean to undergo repolarization? So in depolarization, it's going to become positively charged. So the sodium is the main one that's responsible, and sodium moves in here. So now, even though you have the negative proteins. You have the potassium and now you add sodium and that's why it starts to go from negative five and then eventually it's going to go up to 35 millivolts. And then you have repolarization where then the sodium channels close, potassium channels open and guess what happens? The potassium leaves in that one segment, okay? So in this one block alone, you have depolarization and repolarization occurring. And that's what pushes the signal to move on to the next block, which means when it gets to the next block, in order for it to move on to the third block, what has to happen? It has to un repeat the same process. It has to go to repro. I'm sorry, it has to become depolarized followed by repolarization. Okay, let's do this. I think I lost a few of you. Okay, so here's a ball on top of water. If you put a plastic ball, you can do this at home, put a plastic ball on top of water that's not moving. Is that ball going to move? No, it doesn't. So what you have to do is you have to create waves. You have to cause it to go up and then down. So when there's a wave that goes up and down, that ball is going to move to the next position. And in the next position, the next set of waves is going to move it to the next position. Okay. Depolarization, repolarization. Depolarization repolarization. You have to have a change in membrane potential from positive to negative, positive to negative, positive to negative to create those waves to move that plastic ball, aka the signal. So here's the signal. It moves from here to the next segment, to the next segment, to the next segment, to the next segment, and so on. Does that make sense? Yes, that helps. Okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> okay until finally it reaches the synaptic knob. And that is what an action potential is. So an action potential along the axon, you have to go through series of depolarization, repolarization, depolarization, repolarization, depolarization, repolarization, to move that signal until finally it reaches the synaptic knob. When it reaches the synaptic knob, it's gotta go from the electrical signal to a chemical signal. So it can cross that space and then regenerate that electrical signal along the muscle, okay? So this is what we're looking at right here. Okay. So you have to have a flow, a flux, a, a flux of sodium potassium in and out. Sodium goes in to allow for depolarization, right here, check. Sodium channels go open, sodium moves in, voila. What do you have? What do you have when sodium goes in and causes the membrane to become positively charged? Depolarization. Perfect, thank you. Okay. Then at which point 
the sodium gates close and then potassium channels open. When the potassium channels open, potassium leaves. Oh, why does potassium leave? Why does potassium leave? To make it negatively charged? Yes. And also because potassium is more abundant inside than outside. So potassium goes out. Sodium, which means that sodium is more abundant outside or inside? Outside. Exactly. And that's why it moves in. Okay. So sodium moves in because it's more abundant outside than inside. And that's what leads to depolarization. But when the potassium channels open, potassium leaves. Why? Because it's more abundant inside than outside. But when they do leave, it causes the membrane to become what charge? Negative. Negative. Yeah. So we call that what? Polarized. It's, it's actually the second time it's being negative. And that's why oh. it's not called polarized, but it's called? Polarized. Repolarized. And that's what moves that signal from one segment to the next. The fact that it's going from positive to negative. Then it's going to shoot it to the next area. Then the next area is going to be positive to negative. Then it shoots it onto the next area. And then that repeats. Until it reaches what? The synaptic knob. Perfect. That's it. Whew. <laughs> <laughs>